Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to Black Women Amplified, the podcast. Your host, Monica Wisdom Tyson, brings you downloadable conversations that matter to women around the globe. We discuss all things black girl magic, amplify our voices, and transform our challenges into triumphs. Monica calls on her league of extraordinary women to push our boundaries, share their expertise, and stories of personal transformation. Welcome your host of Black Women Amplified, Monica Wisdom Tyson. Hello, Black Women Amplified family. It is your girl, Monica Wisdom, and I am so excited to be here with you today. Yes, yes, yes. This is a special show. All of my shows are special, but this is really special because it's something, it's a subject that's really close to my heart that I don't think I've ever really talked about before. And it begins with telling the story of my Uncle Mitchell, George Mitchell. George Mitchell was my dad's best friend. And they're up kicking into heaven together, I know, so they're still best friends. And they met in pharmacy college. So like my dad, he became a pharmacist, but he was also a country western singer. And he was country through and through. Meaning, not only did he play country music and sing country music, write and compose his own songs, But every time I was with him, we were watching a Western, High Noon, or some John Wayne movie, or we were watching just a variety show, like Hee Haw. (laughs) And my dad loved Blazing Saddles. So we watched that over and over again. But here's the thing. I had a deep love for country music. And who knew that it would become a love of mine? Like Donnie and Marie, I was a little bit country and a little bit rock and roll but I didn't see myself in it. So I moved on to hip hop until the day I discovered black women and country music. I loaded up my playlist and fell deeper in awe of the expression of truth about black life in America. After hearing the song Seeds, I sent a tweet out wishing I could do a series on black women and country music. Well, baby Jesus responded and today, I would like to introduce you to country music star, Reese Palmer. Her Southern soul is warm, familiar, and inviting. She speaks of real life and speaks truth to power. Her first self-titled album, Reese Palmer, garnered major success, including performing at the White House, the Kennedy Center, and the iconic Grand Ole Opry. Like many great women from St. Louis, Josephine Baker, Maya Angelou, and Jennifer Lewis, Reese charts her own path, including being the first woman to chart in country music in 20 years. Reese has also developed her own platform and radio show called Color Me Country with Reese Palmer. It amplifies the voices of color, completing the tapestry of country music. As Reese heads on tour, she graciously took the time to speak with us about her music, her radio show, and being highlighted in the season two PBS show, American Masters in the Making. Please give a warm welcome to country music star, Grammy nominated artist, and all the things, Miss Reese Palmer. Hello, Black Women Amplified. I have got a treat for you today. Miss Reese Palmer. She is a Black woman in country music. Yes, I said it, Black woman in country music. Hello, Miss Reese. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? I am doing very, very well. And I have to say, I just want to thank you for taking out time and your schedule to come and join us. And I had to talk to a Black woman in country music because when I first heard about all (laughs) y'all there was a (laughs) there was a clip going around of young lady who I guess won the country music award and she said I needed to thank the black women in country music oh Marion yeah and I said now what did she say the black women what is she talking about so I went on a hunt because at this time it was maybe last year I don't know the last two years is kind of a big blur but I was looking for music that spoke to me 
And that wasn't talking about all this other stuff, like was emotional, honest. And I came across you, Mickey Guyton, Chapel Hart, and some other women. I can't remember their names, but I plugged it into my playlist. And I'm telling you, I just laid in the bed and just listened. It was like, whoo, this sounds and feels so good. When did you first fall in love with country music? So it was just from the start. My mom and dad are both from Georgia. I'm a Midwestern girl, but my fam, my roots are very Southern, as I think most Midwestern Black people, especially, are. Mm -hmm. Because my people are from Virginia and Arkansas. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. No, I I mean most of the kids that I went to school with, they had family in Mississippi or Georgia or Alabama or whatever. So you know, great migration. But anyway, my mom and dad are both southern and thoroughly southern and my mother especially like they're both music heads like love music neither one of them are musicians or were musicians but love music just the same and in our household we listen to country artists Mm -hmm. in the same rotation as r&b artists as soul artists as pop artists and gospel artists So on Saturday morning, when my daddy would go to work and my mom and I were home cleaning, my mom would put on, you know, a Dolly Parton record or a Kenny Rogers record. And then that would be followed by Phoebe Snow or Shaka Khan or, you know, any number of these people. And so I just, the thing that struck me, like, I love what you just said about something that just felt warm and comfortable to you, because that's what country music has always been for me, the music has always been spoken to, you know, my time with my family down South or the way I think about love or the way that, you know, I was writing songs like that was, it felt kindred to me. Mm -hmm. And it comes across in all of your music. Now, here's the thing about country music. It is presented as a white man's music. Yes. And there are so many barriers around it. I have to tell you off my my Reva McIntyre experience but how were you able to break through those barriers or what I like to call them barricades to get to the point where you could even be the first black woman to chart out of the gate in 20 years yeah no in 20 years yeah well first of all I it would be I would be remiss if I didn't give credit where credit was due to black women from St. Louis were my very first managers And they were the ones that kind of gave wings to this dream. I always knew that I loved country music and I was writing it along with like a lot of other stuff. And I was a teenager when I first got started. So I was all over the place. Mm -hmm. And I just knew at that time, I just knew I wanted to be famous. And I wanted to be Mariah Carey. I wanted to be Destiny's Child or, you know, any of the people that were popular at that time. And so when I met them, when I was a senior in high school, they came over to my house and met my family and met me and we talked about what I was into. And so the summer after I graduated high school, we went to New York and I started working on a demo. And they, one night in the hotel, asked me what I was always writing in this notebook. I used to carry a notebook around me, <laughs> around with me all the time. And I said, I'm writing songs. And so they were like, read us one of your songs. And I started singing this song that I had written for Reba McIntyre. And they were just like, oh my God, Reese, that's a country song. And I said, yeah. They were like, do you write a lot of those? I said, yeah, I, I do. And again, like you, I didn't think that country music was for me because I'd never seen anybody that looked like me. I'd seen Charlie Pride, but he's a man. And so I had never seen a black woman do it. And so I just didn't think it was a thing. It was very subconscious because I don't think I even consciously thought about that. It just never occurred to me. And so they were like, Reese, that's your thing. Like, that's your thing. Like, we've been trying all these different things with you. That's you. That's you as a singer. And so they were the ones that encouraged me. And so, like, their audaciousness, because they were audacious. <laughs> as St. <laughs> Louis women are. <laughs> Darling, I just remember, like, I'll tell you a very quick story just to illustrate my point. So <laughs> it was the CMAs, which is Country Music Association Award time. And so there's, like, a whole week of festivities. And so... Leslie Leland and Dana Lyons, they were called Us Girls Entertainment at the time. I remember them. Yeah, you know, they were the street team for like No Limit Records at one point. And they used to do a lot of promotions and stuff around St. Louis, but mostly hip hop and R&B. And so hip hop and R&B is a lot more aggressive 
in the way that it's marketed than country music is. And so one of the things that they wanted to do was they blanketed Music Row in Nashville with posters of me. Like on anything that would hold still long enough, they stuck a poster wow. of me on it. And so people, <laughs> we went to the, we somehow got into this mixer and they saw, everybody was like, are you the girl from the posters? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's me. And, you know, and we're these three black women and, you know, Leslie and Dana had the nails going on and the hair and like very colorful outfits. And they're right. just like, I mean, they're stars themselves. So it was very hard to kind of miss us. And so that was the way they just would walk in and talk to people. They would talk their way into situations. And it was amazing. It was amazing to watch. I've never seen anybody manifest the way that Leslie and Dana did. And, you know, a lot of their early work to get me in front of people um, was how I got the training and the tenacity to and the hustle mentality. I mean, like, I don't know two people that hustled harder than Leslie and Dana. And I learned, you know, our time together was a mixed bag and unfortunately did not end very well. But the one thing, positive thing that I take from them is their work ethic. And so... When I was no longer with them, I emulated a lot of that spirit. And I don't know, I'm just one of those people, I'm very focused. And so when I've decided that I'm going to do something, we just do it. And I don't wait for permission. And we just kind of did. And so <laughs> I, um, in the early days, I was so young, I didn't think about the hurdles and the boundaries. I just was like, well, if I want to be a superstar in this and, you know, this girl can do it and this girl can do it, then why can't I? And so that's just, that was the attitude that I took. So did you ever want to go the R&B route or was country, you were solid in the country path? I think once I got my first publishing deal and I started writing, then I was, cause I'll be honest, at first I was like, well, is anybody going to like that? Like, or I was, I was skeptical because I didn't, because again, I'd never seen anybody do it. And so I was just like, well, am I going to get laughed out of here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, am I going to, is are they, am I going to get run out of town? But like, once I got the publishing deal and once I started writing and I started being in these circles and being in Nashville, it just felt like it fit like a glove. Have you written for other artists? So it's funny. I had this conversation last night with a group that I'm mentoring. I don't intentionally write for other artists. Okay. I tend, my writing tends to be very personal. And especially now, now that I'm older, it was a lot more general when I was younger. But now that I'm older, I, I write very specifically to me and my tastes and what I'm looking for. But I have had other artists cut my songs. So and it's mostly early stuff. And so, like I said, it's the stuff that's a little bit more general. I can tell a big difference in your first album, Reese Palmer and Revival. It's like Reese Palmer is a country album through and through but revival is you <laughs> oh yeah because the the song I mean I watched the video to seeds and it just brought tears to my eyes because one it was the subject matter two it was just so beautifully beautifully illustrated and then when you get to the end of the video everybody's working together so the messages yeah. in there were so powerful but the visual was like, okay, I, even if I didn't see hear the music, I would know exactly what you were talking about. What is it that shifted in you to where you were going to show yourself in a whole new way in your album revival? Well, I appreciate you saying that. Adulthood, motherhood happened to me. I have two little girls and I'm more cognizant of the world that I live in than I have ever been before in my life. Mm-hmm. And I just think about the world that my children are inheriting and what that entails, what that looks like, especially for children of color. And it's terrifying. I felt like I have this platform. If I have people looking at me and paying attention to what I'm saying and, and retweeting me and stuff like that, if I'm not, if I'm the only thing I'm doing is talking about my latest show or you know, something that I'm doing and I'm not speaking to like what's happening to my people, then what's the point of having a platform? And so 
to be perfectly honest with you, it was sparked by St. Louis. It was sparked by the murder of Michael Brown. Mm-hmm. I sat and watched that unfold first on Facebook because of friends that I knew that grew up in that neighborhood mm-hmm. that were watching it in real time before it became national news. And then just watching the reaction, watching the insensitive people, things that people say. And, you know, just the way that the, the world handled it, the way that this culture handled it. And I felt like I needed to say something. And so that kind of sparked the shift in my artistry, for sure. You definitely have, like you said, you're very focused. And it seems like you have a very clear idea of what you want, because you have turned down Jam and Lewis, which I don't know who does that. Yes, (laughs) I know. You had to fight. You had, you were like, I'm done with this. I'm going to fight for my name and fight for my rights as an artist. And then now you're moving into, and I'm not going to call it an activism space. I'm going to call it a truth to power space Mm. because in everything you do, you're just telling the truth. Black people have been here. Indigenous people have been here. Latino people have been here and we all sing country music. And so you illustrate that through your radio show, which I love, Color Me Country. Did you know when you started that radio show that it was going to spark a movement amongst country music establishment? No, I really, like, I promise you, like, it wasn't like a calculated thing. And I think a lot of people thought that, like, I'll receive, you know, I don't know. I think people thought I was a lot more calculated than I was. Like, it really was just, What sparked it was the way that I saw publications talking about people of color in country music. This is around the time of like Lil Nas X, Old Town Road, and everybody was doing all these think pieces and they would only mention five artists. And so if you didn't know anything about this art form, you would think that the Black people didn't come in until 1968 with Charlie Pride. And that's absolutely not true. And I just got tired of it being like this very myopic view that it was only Charlie and Jimmy and Kane and Mickey and Darius. And I know for a fact that that's not it because I was one of those. And so I just wanted to tell the truth. I wanted there to be a clearer picture of what it really was. And I had a really hard time trying to find the evidence, like you could find the names scattered here and there if you were doing like a really, really deep, thorough search, but none of this information was like readily available. And so this was at the beginning of the pandemic and my very best friend in the whole wide world encouraged me, her name is Shelly Warren, encouraged me to to pursue it because I talked about it like incessantly. <laughs> and so she was like, girl, <laughs> do something with this. <laughs> And so I was, you know, it was the pandemic and my babies were home and, you know, all my gigs were canceled. So I knew everybody else was home. So I decided what I wanted to do at best was make a historical record that these people existed, that there were more people and more names that deserve to be talked about and acknowledged and so on. And so that's really what it started out as. It was really just me trying to historically preserve for future generations so that nobody else could say that there were only five. Mm -hmm. That's my mission with this podcast is to highlight Black women so that we archive our stories. Mm -hmm. Because there's so many of us in different avenues that you've never heard of before. And our generation, I'm Generation X, we don't talk about stuff. So I said, well, I'm going to make, I'm going to find a way that they'll talk about their stuff. (laughs) Exactly. exactly. People have to know we're here. You know, we are here. And speaking of your radio show, it brought tears to my eyes to see you. I know you see, you think she cries a lot. <laughs> <laughs> to see your interview with Anita Porter. Oh, oh, yeah. Girl. She was so much fun. And I feel like it's longer than what I saw. So I want to know how can I Oh, yeah, it is. It? <laughs> It is. And I, you know, after this, I can send you the whole thing so you can hear the full, the full thing. It, that was magical. I, oh God. So we were talking about Black Music Month. And again, history is really important to me because again, if we don't say your name, then like this stuff, get this information gets lost to the ages. 
Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure, like the Pointer Sisters, not a lot of people know this. Pointer Sisters are the first Black women to ever be nominated and win a country Grammy. They're the first Black group. There was not another nomination by a Black woman until Mickey Guyton two years ago. I had no idea. (laughs) So you just told me. Yeah. Pointer Sisters have also highest charting Black group ever. They have had songs covered by country artists and they have, I believe, yes, the highest charting position for a black group on the billboard charts. And they're the first to play the Grand Ole Opry as well. The first black female group or black group to play the Grand Ole Opry. Mm. And like they had protesters when they went to go play. So, I mean, like they're pioneers, like they really, really are. So I made a list of people that I wanted to talk to. And I was just like, I would love to get a pointer sister. If I could get a pointer sister (laughs) on the show. A a pointer sister. (laughs) I don't even care who. I was just like, I just want a pointer sister. And so (laughs) when I found out that we were going to have her, I was just like, I was floored because, you know, I'm an 80s baby. So like, I remember when the pointer sisters were like Destiny's Child. And so it was just like, she's so funny. She's one of the fun. She was so funny. And like her stories were amazing. We couldn't put everything in the show because it's only a two hour show. But I just was like, oh my God, I love you so much. Like it was just, the whole time I'm just smiling and like just ear to ear because she just, it was just great. And it was like, I'm actually sitting here. I cannot believe that me, Reese Palmer, this little girl from West County, is sitting on the phone on Zoom looking at Anita Pointer and talking to Anita Pointer. And then, you know, of course, she just passed away. And so I'm really glad that I have a recorded history of her talking about that time. Yeah, when her video came up, I was like, oh, my God. And then I just kept, oh, my God. And then knowing that she had just passed and Mm -hmm. on New Year's Eve 2022, I was like, what magical divine timing that you were able oh, to record her stories literally at the sunset of her life. And yeah. that's remarkable. And that's, be- it's nothing but God. I know that, but it's just beautiful. Absolutely. That's a beautiful mission that you have for your radio show. And speaking of legacies, you yourself have carved out an amazing path. You p- performed at the White House. You performed at the Kennedy Center. You've been on all the things, Oprah and CNN. But I have to know, what was it like when you first stepped on stage at the Grand Ole Opry? Not just as an artist, but as a Black woman. What did that feel like? It was magical. I will never forget it for the rest of my life. And actually, there's a really great, if y'all feel like going on YouTube and Googling, there's a great video from that day. They had a camera crew follow me that whole day. And um it was magical. Like it was something that I had dreamed about since I was a little girl. And all the people that I have admired and followed and been inspired by have all stood in that circle. And at the time, I didn't realize that I was the second Black woman to play the Grand Ole Opry at that time. So I didn't even know that. I just was, I was blown away. And the people that were backstage, like Pam Tillis is the one that introduced me. And, you know, I was always a fan of Pam Tillis. And like, it just, it was, my grandmother was there. That was one of the few, I'm really glad she lived to see a lot of these first. I wish that, you know, I wish she could see this part of my career. I think she'd be really proud, but she was around for that first part. And so she got to be there. It was great. It was a blessing. So how many times have you performed now? Lord, I think I've played, I've lost track at this point. I think I've played it maybe like eight times. <laughs> I know that sounds so like cavalier, like, oh, you know. Look, that's a good problem to have. <laughs> I'm yeah, good track. Well, you know, when <laughs> I'm I lived, a regular. When I, <laughs> when I lived there, you get a call. Like once you've done it the first time, you get the call pretty regularly, like, oh, hey, can you fill, you know, can you fill in for somebody or, you know, are you around this Tuesday or like that kind of thing. And like, you never tell them no. Mm -hmm. So every time they've called, I've gone, I've played it. I know that's right. Even if you have to get the car and drive in the car and drive across the country, I will be there. (laughs) No, I'll be there. Tuesday six, I will be there. 
Now, delving into your career, you have put out a children's album that garnered two Grammy nominations. Well, so it actually wasn't that album. It was projects that I've done subsequent to that album. But because of that album, because of that album, I was invited to be on other projects. And that's what got me the Grammy nominations. I see. But you were in the Grammy Museum. Yes. <laughs> For the power of women and country music. What was that call like? Uh, <laughs> so my publicist sent me the email and she was like, oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and I read the email and I was like, oh my God. Like, I'll just be perfectly honest with you. The last couple of years have been just extremely um, surreal. Mm-hmm. And I have to be perfectly honest with you. I struggle with a lot of imposter syndrome because my own definition of what success is, is sometimes different than, you know, what is actually happening to me. Cause I just, I have a lot of expectations for myself and that sort of thing. So when I saw it, I was just like, really? Why me? Cause I was looking at some of the other people that were in there. I'm like, cause Dolly Parton and I, because of our last names are always next to each other whenever we're being talked about in alphabetical order. And so I'm just like, how is my dress in a museum right next to Dolly Parton's dress? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> that's crazy talk. But I have learned that I take the accolade and I, and I use it as fuel to continue the fight. So, yeah, I'm honored. I'm extremely humbled and, and very honored. Well, it, it kind of makes sense because Dolly Parton is who you listened to as a kid. Mm-hmm. And we know Dolly Parton outside of her great country music is for her song with Whitney Houston. So she's right. been all up in our business. Oh yeah. <laughs> she's Aside- one of the gateway drugs. Yeah. <laughs> if you can hear, if you watch nine to five or you heard Jolene or any of the, you know, any of the projects she put out and, you know, gro- we didn't have genres back in the day. We listened to everybody at the same time. Yeah, Exactly. So we were listening to Black Sabbath and Dolly Parton and whoever else all in the same hour. So we didn't really have a distinction. It was just like, what lane do we want to pick as as things kind of filtered out and separated. But I love the fact that your music now is so reflective of all of that because revival is very soulful. It's very country. It's just honest music. And I love it. And I, I want to know musically, What direction are you going in now? So this new project that I'm working on now that I've been talking about for the past three years. (laughs) The new project. (laughs) Yes, that I promise is coming out. (laughs) So I will be, Lord, I'm doing, it's going to be um, not unlike Revival and as far as touching on a bunch of different things, but this one is definitely a little bit more country a little bit more singer songwriter just because of where I am in my life right now. So yeah, I think you can expect it's going to be a mixture of that first album and revival for sure. Well, the beauty is your music evolves, which I love to see. Yeah, There's nothing better than growing with an artist because we all get in our quiet spaces where we just want to have a conversation with ourselves. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And you just happen to put it out in the world. So I can't wait for the next project. And hopefully I won't have to wait a couple more years for it. No, I promise it's coming. (laughs) So I want to go back a little bit to your radio show, Color Me Country. First of all, the Apple platform, I didn't realize the radio shows had so much involvement because you have video, you have audio, and you also Mm -hmm. give the playlist of the artists that you interview which I think is great because there were some people on there was like, well, who is that? You know, and I didn't know that there were indigenous country artists. I should have, you know, music is music, but it's just beautiful to see that you're displaying so many different genres. What was it like when you were trying to get your music played on the radio? Um, Hell, I think that's why I try to make this process so much easier for people. Because I don't think people realize how hard it is to get on country radio. Like, it's very expensive. It involves a lot of stuff that has nothing to do with music. I mean, people would just simply play you if they just like you. 
like if they like you at a person or if they didn't like your visit like I can remember being tired while we were out doing radio tour and like sometimes we would get to a radio station it wasn't because I had something personal against the person I just was tired Mm -hmm. and so I wasn't like super bubbly or whatever and so they would just be like well she was kind of a jerk so I don't want to play her music Oh, wow. Like just something as simple as that, even if you like the song, even if the song is going up the charts, like if I just don't like you, I'm not going to play it. So you're at the whim and at the mercy of these music directors, program directors, and depending on whatever vendetta or agenda they have, you live and die by that, which is insane to me. Yeah, it was very hard, very hard to get <laughs> on the radio. I mean, like, I'll be honest with you, St. Louis didn't even play me. I can believe that. And I'm from here. Yeah. Like people would call in and, and ask for it and they wouldn't play it. I can, <laughs> it is Missouri. <laughs> it is Missouri. <laughs> we know what that means. But I just, mm-hmm. when I was thinking about this whole process of putting this conversation together, all I could think was because your music is excellent. And the only thing that came to me was, but for her complexion, because your music should be at the top of all the charts, not just country. And I just well, kept saying, you. but for her hue, but for her complexion. So the level of racism within music, because I know every genre has its problems. Hip hop has its problems. Soul has its problems. Mm-hmm. But country music has a specific problem. So here's what I want to, this is a personal question. What did your parents teach you about how to deal with racism in America? Well, you know, my mom and dad, being that my father, you know, was from Atlanta mm. and grew up toward the end of the civil rights movement. He was a little boy. I mean, they, they were members of Ebenezer Baptist Church. So like they were right in the thick of it and West Hunter. And so my dad was always very honest. Both of my parents were very honest and very candid. And I grew up in a neighborhood where we were like one of maybe 10 Black families when I was a kid and it, you know, it became more integrated as I got older, but you know, like I was five the first time I got called nigger. And so and I remember it like it was yesterday. And I won't tell you what my mom told me to say back. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> no, we won't, we won't but, do that. <laughs> no, we won't say that. <laughs> but you know, they were just very matter of fact, like, you know, you bow down to no one. Mm. And you don't have to bow down because you're worthy. You're more than worthy. And so I I didn't necessarily have a chip on my shoulder, but I also wasn't naive. And so I just went through life like I'm going to do my best. Like, of course, you know, every Black parent is like, you got to be 10 times better than everybody. Mm -hmm. So like, I, you know, I I worked really hard in school and, and just pretty much at everything that I did, I just tried to be the absolute best that I could. And I was an overachiever. I always have been. But well, that's evident in your career. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because you're under 80 and you've already performed at the White House. So it's evident. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. No, I just, but I'll tell you what, more than my parents, just my upbringing prepared me. Like going to school at Eureka, a school that had voluntary desegregation when I was in school. And this was like the 90s. This wasn't the 60s. This wasn't the 70s. Like this was the 90s. You know, being one of the few Black students that lived in the suburbs and having to deal with the dichotomy of, well, I live in this neighborhood with all these white kids, but I identify with all these Black kids from the city that look just like me and listen to a lot of the same things that I listen to. But I'm also a lot like these white kids too. I listen to this music and that music and I'm into this and that. And so always kind of feeling like I was in the middle. And so I had to, like, they didn't have a name for it back then, but now we call it code switching. And so I did a lot of code switching growing up. And it's funny, like, it totally prepared me for my job. Like, I know Tupac and Biggie just as much as anybody else, but I also know Garth Brooks and, you know, John Michael Montgomery. And I can speak authoritatively about both of them. And so... Yeah, my upbringing totally prepared me for for, <laughs> <laughs> for my job. It's almost scary how much I was prepared for life. Mm. Like none of this felt weird to me because I was just like, oh, I know this. This is right. like this is like 
I know you. Like I've met this brand <laughs> before. Oh, you think you can take me down? Watch me work. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I've met you before. I know exactly who you are. Come on, let's go. Now, before we get out of here, I hope you come back because I could literally talk to you forever, but I know you have a performance tonight. So I appreciate you taking the time. I want to talk about this docu-series on PBS. Now, first of all, Audra McDonald, my favorite of all favorite. I, know, I know! I was like, Audra McDonald. <laughs> I know! I was shook. I was shook. <laughs> I remember seeing her, her in on Broadway in Porgy and Bess. And I think somebody needed to close my mouth because she was stunning. Physically and musically and all the things. So how was it working on this documentary? And tell us, please tell us more about it. So the documentary is, first of all, it's a part of a new series that American Masters is doing called In the Making. And it is designed to talk about artists. You know, a lot of American Masters are done at the end of your life or toward the end of your career, kind of like a retrospective. Whereas this is more so like, this is what's happening now. Like this is history in the making. This is a legacy type of career in the making. So I was really honored to be a part of it. And Black Woman is the director and producer. Her name is Dilsey Davis. She is from Durham, the city that I now live in. And we used to teach together at a children's theater here in Durham. Um, she taught my daughter, my oldest daughter, in an acting class. Like, Dilsey's amazing. She's an amazing filmmaker. And she's also a mom. And so she, like, we we get each other. Like, we totally get each other. Mm -hmm. And Dilsey was offered the opportunity to direct one of these episodes. And I thought it was so cool. She thought of me. And so, like, on my 40th birthday, she called me and she was just like, hey, do you have time to hop on a Zoom? And um, we ended up talking about my career and I just told her my story. And she was like, Reese, you are, you're the subject. So she submitted me, they approved it. And so we filmed all last year. And last year was one of my busiest years because I was doing the show. I was also on tour with Chris Stone Kingfish, the blues artist. He's amazing. He took five black women out on tour last year. It was great. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really dope. Like they made a concerted effort to take female artists out last year. It was great. So we were on the, me and my band were in the middle of a tour. And it was also the first year that I curated a stage of all Black, Indigenous, and Latinx women country artists for a festival in London called uh, Long Road Festival. And so it documented me doing the show and doing all these things. In addition to raising my babies, and, you know, being a mom. And so it was a lot. I don't know that I ever want to be followed by cameras <laughs> ever again. Because <laughs> like we said at the beginning of this, like if you don't have to have on makeup, you just don't. And right. so like, I was just like, I don't know how many more shots I need to see of me without makeup on. But it was, <laughs> or like with my hair up in a bun or something, like no one needs to see this. So. It was hard at times, but Dilsey handled the story with so much care. And I finally got to see it last week. And it's beautiful. It's 40 minutes, but it's 40 minutes done really beautifully. And I just, I tip my hat to her and her artistry because she's phenomenal. Yeah, it's beautiful. It airs March 24th. It's called Reese Palmer, Still Here. And it'll be on at nine o'clock on PBS, all PBS stations. And I'm just, I'm blown away and honored. And after that, it'll be on demand. Oh, I'm happy for you. Thank you. To jump in this, at, well, I'm sure you've been doing it your whole life, but to jump in at 2007 and just all the twists and turns and truly you are still here and just beginning because the Reese Palmer story now the masses will know who you are and I can't wait to see how you excel in that and you know doing all the things and doing yourself and that's the beauty of it is you're doing it as yourself as an independent artist and you're able to say the things you want to say and do it the way you want to do it and that's freedom and that's power yeah it is it is that's the greatest freedom of all so I know you have to get to a show and you have to do all the things to get ready for the show. So good luck with your show. I know you're Thank going you. on 
quick blurb about your tour coming up? Yes, I'm going out on tour with my sister, one of my peers when I first started this career. So I'm really excited that she's, you know, that she's still here, Miko Marks. Mm -hmm. And we are going out on tour for the first two weeks of May. The tour is called the Miko and Reese show. <laughs> <laughs> because it is a show when Reese and Nico are together. <laughs> we actually have a single coming out, a duet that we did, that we wrote together. Comes out the same day as the documentary, and it's called Still Here. That's why the doc is called Still Here. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, and it, it lands on March 24th on all streaming platforms and everything. So I'm really excited. And, you know, I think this is the, the second time that two Black women in country music have gone on tour with each other. The second time ever? The second time ever. The <laughs> first was the, Britney look, Spencer. Listen, when you write, <laughs> when you write your um, memoir, I want you, it to be entitled The Second Time Ever. Yeah. Because every time you do time, it's the second time ever. <laughs> it's the <laughs> second right. time a, a Black woman ever charted. It's the second time a Black woman's performed on the Grand Ole Opry stage. It's the second time. <laughs> That's the I name know. of your memoir. You know You're welcome. <laughs> I was thinking about naming my memoir, No Joke, Second Runner Up, because when I used to do pageants in St. Louis, mm -hmm. Hal Jackson's talented team pageant, I came in every year. I won Miss Congeniality and Second Runner Up every year without fail. <laughs> I was just like, damn, what do I need to do? What do I need or, to do? Not enough makeup. <laughs> not enough makeup. Or something. I don't know. I was like, can I get first runner up? Like, why? <laughs> Like, what is second runner-up exactly? <laughs> Why? Yeah, just consistently. Like, I have at my parents' house, all my little second runner-up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're winning now, honey. You are winning now. Thank you. It's good. Oh, I hope you come back. You have an open invitation, but thank you so much for this conversation. It was very enlightening. And I hope that people get to know more about you. So please tell people where they can find you, your radio, your website, all the things. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. This has been super fun. I really, really appreciate it. And you know, and you St. Louis, so you people. Right. <laughs> you people. As we all say, we're all cousins in St. Louis. <laughs> we're all cousins. It's fine. <laughs> and we know so many of the same people. That's crazy. Like off mic, we were comparing notes. It's nuts. Yes. But <laughs> the real stories. I know the real story, Lord. <laughs> you can go to ReesePalmer.com to find out tour dates and, and airings and new music and all that good stuff. You can also go to ColorMeCountry.com. That is the website for the show, as well as Color Me Country Artist Grant Fund, which I started two years ago for artists of color pursuing careers in country and Americana music. And soon to be the home for the Color Me Country Foundation, my nonprofit, which I just started this year. So we're going to be doing all the stuff. So you can find all things about that on ColorMeCountry.com. I have to hook you up with my best friend. She's like the queen of nonprofit. Oh, yes. I need all the help I can get. Please. Okay. I got you. <laughs> and then the show is Color Me Country Radio with Reese Palmer on Apple Music Country. You can hear it for free. Every other Saturday at 11 p.m. I mean, 11 a.m. Central, 12 p.m. Eastern. All you got to do is just look up Reese Palmer in your iTunes and the show will come up. Perfect. Thank you again so much. And I Thank really you. appreciate you being here. And I will talk to you soon. I will talk to you soon. You take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Black Women Amplified. We hope you enjoyed the show. Be sure to subscribe and log on to blackwomenamplified.com for more information. Keep shining. Mm -hmm.